You're listening to Nurture Your Zest. I'm your host, Ashley King, and I will introduce you to a wealth of interesting, fascinating individuals from all walks of life who will share their stories, how they've overcome challenges, and you will find out their top tips for success. Through this podcast, you can gain tips to grow and change your life and the way you see the world and help you to nurture your zest. everyone it's great to speak with you again uh, today I have Lucy Kendall with me in the studio today and I'm really excited Lucy is actually one of my inspirational mentors that I um, am really glad that I met I can't even remember when we met um, but I'm just so glad that we've been brought together um, so I'd love to introduce you now um, Lucy would you like to tell us a bit about yourself Yes, I'd love to. Thanks, Ash. Inspirational mentor. Wow. <laughs> That's something to live up to. Um, so, yes, I am a Northumbrian, born and bred, lived in the northeast of England my whole life. Um, I have uh, taken an interesting career path that I'm sure we'll touch on, um, not least to Durban, where I did my master's. So always glad to meet a South African. There's still a bit of South African left in you. Um, and and I, I currently am chief exec of COCO, we're an international children's charity based here in Newcastle and we do work in Tanzania, Kenya and Uganda. Um, I'm an MBA graduate and um, all around supporter of all things northeast and international. That's brilliant. And actually, I thought I knew lots about you, but I've learned something new um, about your time in Durban. I'm sure you've told me that, but I feel like... Um, possibly because we've always been working on projects and other things. It might have just slipped out of my mind. So can you tell me, um, tell us a bit more about Durban and your time there? Well, I think um, my my path to South Africa was a real serendipitous one. Um, I was lucky enough to go to boarding school in the lakes um, at the ripe old age of 14. So I joined my fellow girls um, at Casterton School when they'd all been there for a while. Um, but I made some incredible friends, one of whom, um, Kat, her dad was working in the armed forces in Zimbabwe and training up the army there and when we left uni well when we left school when we got to the end of school she said what are you going to do when you when you leave and I said well I don't know I haven't really got any plans and she said I'm going to go and work on a safari park in Zimbabwe my dad sorted out for me do you want to come and I thought yeah (laughs) why not so I went over to Zimbabwe had three incredible months in in Zim got to meet um, some amazing people and probably just fell in love with the kind of I'm always told off for sort of putting Africa in one basket and I totally get that Um, it's a very diverse continent but there's something about the culture of people in sub-Saharan Africa the the way they welcome you the smell of the place the look of the place like it just felt like home from home so I had a great time and that's that put me on my path towards a career that would hopefully take me to Africa. <laughs> so that was that. <laughs> well, now I understand that. I now understand your passions for Africa and why you do the work you do. And that's really interesting. I also wish I had a friend called Kat because that sounds like an amazing opportunity. Um, I do actually want to ask about your experience, age 14, going into a uh, all-girls boarding school That to me sounds like it would be really tough. I mean, um, I'm just reflecting back to when I moved to to the UK, I was around the same age and actually just that time of change when you're going into a new space and you're a teenage girl and you're going through all sorts of things. um, Did you experience that? How was your time going into a place where people already had formed friendships? I think um, I was really lucky because um, I... My mum had been to boarding school when she was much younger and she was sent to boarding school, that's how she puts it, when she was only seven years old. So she was really, really young and I'm glad I didn't go at that age, although I have some really good friends who did. But I went to state school, I had a really good education and and I don't knock the state system at all. But um, when I went up to high school, um, I really struggled because I... 
I was quite outspoken and opinionated (laughs) and those who know me now probably know that I still have those traits but I've kind of learned to control them a little bit better but at school I would say what I thought and sometimes it would land me in trouble. I would say what I thought even if it was to a 16 year old girl who was 10 times my size and didn't want to hear what I had to say. So I ended up, um, I, I was definitely bullied at school and it it wasn't the kind of bullying where I'd go home and cry. It was the kind of bullying where I'd go home and my my shirt would be ripped or someone would have dropped a water bomb on my head. So I couldn't really hide it from my mum and dad. Um, I probably would have if I could. Um, and they just said, right, we've had enough of this. We're going to look at a different school. And I think this has been the story of my life, actually. Out of adversity come huge opportunities. And I've just grabbed them with both hands and I was so lucky I just recently put a post on Facebook because um, most of my year, well all of my year group at boarding school are turning 40 in the next academic year and um, we decided to all get together um, and so we went to Bangor in Northern Ireland for a long weekend and it was great to see the girls and after that I, I posted a picture of our whole year group of which there was only about 40 people and tagged them all in it and I just said thank you so much for making me feel so welcome because there was no bullying there was no there was probably meanness but when a new girl arrived everyone sort of rallied around to and everyone wanted to know about the new girl oh who is she what does she look like what does she do where she come from what are her stories and those girls are still my best friends to to date and I think it was a huge opportunity for me. That's really incredible, actually hearing how close you all got and, you know, how many people meet up at a reunion where the entire class comes. You know, how did you find a place that you could all hang out in? Did you just get the same hotel and then go out for meals? Or how did you even manage that logistically? There was actually, there was a select few. So there's probably 40 of us in the whole year group. But the group of friends that we had, all of us made it, apart from one who's in Hong Kong and she was running a double marathon across the Sahara or something. She's absolutely crackers. Um, And another one who's just come back from maternity. But everybody else made a real effort to, to be there if they could be and uh, we got a beautiful house on Airbnb um, and typical boarding school girls we just all got in the rooms together and it was just like school all over again. (laughs) Oh that's really beautiful I love that I think friendship's really important actually when um, when you're going through a tough time to have people who rally around you and lift you up and give you that support it can be really powerful. Yeah as, as much at 14 as at 39. I think it's really important all the time. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Lucy, I know that you're a mentor and I'm interested in, uh, you know, you're saying at 14 and 40, friendship's important and having amazing people around you is important. Um, I wanted to ask what you think about um, girls today and what they might be going through and just as a as a female leader, do you, do you ever think about... Um, how to inspire or or mentor young women you must have a a lot of young women who you work with or you come across through your work with the university or other um charity work that you do and I just wondered how um how do you see yourself now in that way well I think um firstly there, I do have a pri- the privilege of working with um, young people quite frequently and I'm, I feel really blessed to do that. Um, I'm a school governor up at Fellside in Wickham and Fellside Primary is an incredible school and the the boys and girls there are they're all at primary level so they haven't kind of got to that stage where I kind of really worry about young girls especially um my niece is um coming up 11 she'll be 11 later on this year this month and um I worry about how much she cares about what other people think and I'm going to say it, but social media, um, social media can be in, an incredible source for good. But um, we talked about this, actually, um, when we got together in Northern Ireland about how we're so glad that we grew up without Facebook. And I know it's it does some great things now, but we it was the, the days before straighteners and we all had big 
bushy hair and we never plucked our eyebrows and we didn't care if our clothes were designer or in fact nobody's clothes were designer and some of these girls were really well off but those weren't the things that we cared about we cared about going being outside being together doing stuff together I mean we weren't little angels you know we were naughty plenty of time (laughs) but we were there was a kind of there was a different kind of innocence that I think I worry about losing and I see that when I go out to East Africa and visit some of the schools that we work with because I'm almost almost envious of the 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 children that are in East Africa who still have a hold of that purity and that value of friendship and and family. And I'm not saying that it's completely disappeared, but there's so much pressure on young girls now to be perfect, whether they have to look a particular way or their hair has to be a particular way or they have to wear the right clothes. And I'm probably a really irritating auntie for my niece because if she wears ripped jeans when she comes to stay with me, she gets an eye roll, (laughs) especially in this weather. It's too cold. Um, But also, I genuinely want to just keep an eye on her. She's beautiful inside and out, but she would be anyway. She's my niece, but but she, you know, she worries about things. She worries about what she looks like and and who her friends are. and, And I think I don't want her to worry about that at 11 I want her to to just enjoy her childhood and and that's something I think we had and and I I worry that that's not there for girls now not all of them anyway it's really interesting hearing you say that actually um I'm really impressed by some of the fashion and makeup of (laughs) girls today I don't even know how they know how to do the makeup they do I mean sometimes I look at the way I do makeup and I think It's just very much put the foundation on with your fingers, you know, put whatever you want. You can quickly because you're in a rush to get wherever you're going. But there is some serious uh, artistry going on, you know, from a very young age, lots of YouTube videos and stuff like this. I I think the only thing that I makes me a bit sad is sometimes when I see how much false nails and false eyelashes and false things um, I actually quite like to wear things like that myself from time to time. But um, I also think it's nice to be natural. And I love nothing more than just being outdoors in the forest with no makeup. <laughs> yeah. Well, I said I introduced No Makeup Mondays at work and they've kind of become No Makeup Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And tell you what, we'll only wear makeup if we've got a meeting day. <laughs> and not everyone wants to do that but um it's quite nice at Coco that we were all girls until very recently when Matt joined us and um and we just don't feel like we have to go the extra mile I think it's important to be professional and be well put together so you know if we're representing the organization we make a bit of an effort but I, I, I want them there using their brains and being creative and it's not important to me what they look like (laughs) as long as they're there and happy and maybe they've got an extra half an hour in bed because they didn't have to do precision eyebrows um or something else so I mean it's each to their own and I completely get that if I'm going into I just had a board meeting yesterday and part of my ritual for being ready for the boardroom is to do my makeup and put my Jo Malone perfume on and put my heels on and it gets me in the right frame of mind to be professional and I think that's really important but you've got to have a you've got to have an off day too you've got to have a sofa day (laughs) and and life's so crazy right now it's and so busy and hectic that it's quite nice to know that you can have a little bit of that kind of sense of well-being and just being yourself at work as well you don't have to wait for the weekend. Absolutely. Um, being happy at work is actually, I mean, it's its really important, isn't it? You want people to give their best and they're going to do that when they are um, feeling secure and safe. And and yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I also have a ritual for meetings or power dressing from time to time. And it's amazing. Even um, I haven't gone through a breakup for a really long time and I hope I never will again touch base, uh, touch word rather. Um, but uh, even things like that where you need to power dress, it's amazing the power of a pair of heels and some red lipstick or something like this. It can really be um, transformative, I think. 
Yeah, and I think where where that's really important for women, I, th- I completely embrace it and and think it's important. I just the thing that concerns me is when when young girls feel that they have to be doing it straight away. I mean, I think I was probably a little bit like that. I mean, most of us have attacked our mum's makeup kits and ruined their Lancome lipstick because we didn't know what we were doing with it. And I think that's all part of growing up and childhood. But I, I do worry that people are growing up too quickly. And I wonder if the generations before us said the same thing. And this is just what you say now. But there's never been a transformation quite as big as, as social media. And we're living through it and it's really exciting and it has huge potential. But Young young girls, young boys, young anybody, are, they're just so worried about so many things, whether it's their appearance or climate change or, you know, what's going to happen to the world. And, you know, we we spend our Sunday evenings watching David Attenborough and, and it's always so sad and so real. And, and you would usually sort of watch that and then go back to your normal life. But now kids are really like taking it into the classroom, taking it to their teachers and standing up and... And shouting about things and making people be accountable and you kind of feel like is it their responsibility to do that but whether we want it to be their responsibility or not they're doing it (laughs) and we just have to be there to support them as parents aunties sisters brothers whoever it's so true and actually um you're right uh it's a lot of responsibility for young shoulders um i do think probably around um i'm just thinking it was a remembrance day yesterday so uh thinking about during the world war one and two uh there was probably a lot of kids worrying at that stage as well um you know uh about being soldiers or helping out or doing growing food or all these kind of things so i'm sure it's not the first time kids have been worried but it's nice to see i think how many kids are actually uh, taking up a cause and you know um, doing so much for that but um, I do think as well that you know I'm, I'm just thinking of climate change specifically um, that there are kids who are saying you know it's it's ruining their childhood their childhood has been stolen and that's really really sad I think to think um, environment's so important I know uh when I've worked with you previously you know there's lots of energy saving going on and efficiencies and um actually on that note did you learn that through lean startup principles or lean management principles or is it just a Lucy thing well my do you know my my whole um sort of experience of learning about management and business um particularly the MBA I hope I'm not jumping the gun here by mentioning it um I I did the MBA after I'd been in business for sort of 10 years and I thought that was a really good time to do it with with hindsight that was perfect because I was doing lean management but I didn't know what it was (laughs) and it was a little bit sort of inflicted upon me because of resource so we didn't as running a charity you don't have a lot of money and every penny that you spend on the heating or more staff is less classrooms and less kids going to school so it's a simple equation but you've got to be lean all the time um and there, there was quite a few things that I realised that I didn't realise that I was doing until I did my MBA. So I remember um, being in my uh, strategic human resource classes and thinking, mm, that's what I've been doing. I've been strategically managing my human resource, but it didn't have the, that name. And I didn't realise that that's what I was doing. And um, and I think that's why that I think the MBA is a great thing to do. Um, regardless but for me coming into play at that point in my career was perfect because not only did I learn new things but I learned that what I had been doing was either a tried and tested approach or was an approach by a particular kind of person or leader so I really got the chance to do a lot of self-reflection and learn a lot about who I was Um, and I'm definitely a very lean manager (laughs) and and also we we looked at different leadership styles and I think that's really important and I wish I kind of wish I'd done that a bit earlier to be honest because I think as and it's not just a woman thing I, I I I like to class myself as a feminist because I believe in equality and I know that men have this issue as well but it is scientifically and research based proven that women doubt themselves so much more than men and I think when you've gone into a job at 
um, 24 as a volunteer and worked your way up to chief executive, you're always questioning whether you're the right person to be doing that job and if you're good enough. And I think going to do the MBA really made me realise that actually maybe I am good enough and and what I'm not good enough at, I think I know how to get better. (laughs) So it was an incredible opportunity for me. Also in that time, you know, 10 years, the level of expertise and development and knowledge you would have gained is, is really incredible as well. So um, it's it's so interesting hearing you talking about um, doubting yourself because I think m- many of us do have that. I know for me doing my MBA now, I'm, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, should I even be here? This is so hard, um, mainly because we're doing a lot of finance right now and it's not my favorite, but it's something that, you know, I know I'm being stretched and, and that stretching exercise is actually really powerful. So, um, yeah, you just got to take it on the chin. Yeah, <laughs> but I think, you know, it'll be incredibly good for you and you're getting to immerse yourself in it full time, which is incredible. I was really lucky and I would never have applied to do an MBA by myself Um, and I think that comes back to the fact that if you want to if you want to be succeed or if you want to be a an authentic leader which is what my my coach and I did a lot of work to work out what kind of leader I wanted to be and what I actually was and finally coaxed it out of me but you need to surround yourself with people who are better at things than you are and I think I've been doing that my whole life um without necessarily thinking of it as a as a method of development but just for necessity when i started working at coco it was 2004 and there were um two other members of staff who quickly left the organization when i started it wasn't something i said it was just circumstance and i was completely on my own at 24 in a charity where there was people's expectations to meet and responsibilities to be met and the chairman was off to the olympics and for two months so i was completely isolated and i could have either sat in that office and gone right i have no idea what i'm doing what on earth am i going to do or i could ask for help and i did ask for help and i've never stopped since and i think i do it in a different way now probably through networking and meeting new people um and putting posts on LinkedIn I'm always asking for help of some sort and I think you've always got to be willing to do that and then and then if you surround yourself by all those helpful wonderful people one of them might turn out to be someone who really believes in you and suggests that you get sponsored to do an MBA and that can transform everything Wow, that's amazing that that opportunity came up for you. But it also highlights why it is important to ask for help and to have connections and why network, your network really is everything. And I know you're a pro networker, so that's that's really helpful to see how that's been uh, exemplified in your career. Um, you did say earlier you had a, a an interesting career. So how how has your career changed? I know you've been at uh, Coco for a long time and you've uh, really grown with it, you know, as a person professionally and personally. Um, but before Coco, what were you doing? So um, after I did my three month stint in Zimbabwe with Kat, uh, I came back and I worked. Um, I actually got my A level results in a, a store cupboard on Lake Kariba in Zimbabwe on a really crackly phone line, and then got a fax to confirm what my results were and I was telling my niece about this and she was like a fax what's a fax and then I realized how old I was um and I remember getting my results and I'd done really badly in art history and I was supposed to get an A and I think I'd well done really badly I think I got a a D which was pretty bad when I was supposed to get an A so all of a sudden everything changed I I was thinking I'll go off and do art history and I'll be one of those fabulous people in the Tate like explaining this beautiful Turner piece of art and and that's what I thought I was going to do and I just thought I'm not ready to make a decision yet um I'm too scared everything's changed and I'm in a store cupboard in Zimbabwe and so mum and dad were really supportive and said right well when you come back home just get a part-time job and you can start uni later so 
because I took Kat up on her offer to go to Zimbabwe, I decided to take a path that would lead me into doing work in in on the continent of Africa. So I took up um, geography at Sheffield Hallam. And I had the most incredible South African lecturer. She was amazing, Paula. She really um, saw something in me. She she was my mentor. She helped me through my dissertation. She was incredibly supportive. And when I was about to leave uni, she said, what are you going to do next? And I said, well, they're giving um, £7,000 to anyone who wants to be a teacher. So I think I'll just be a teacher because I've got no money. I'm completely broke. I've just finished uni. I've been a waitress throughout uni and I've got nothing. Like, um, And she said, well, you could do that. But what do you really want to do? And we had a chat about it and she said, tell you what, I think you should apply for a place at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban because you love talking about and working around subjects affecting sub-Saharan African development. And I said, really? A master's? Me? Hmm, I only got like a, you know, a 2-2. Can I do that? Um, And I applied and again, thanks to my parents, because I wouldn't have been able to afford the airfare. (laughs) Um, I worked really, really hard um, at a cafe and at a restaurant and made enough money to go over to South Africa and do my master's and it was one of the best years of my life it was incredible I I was suddenly going to university in Durban in South Africa my my commute to uni was um on foot in the absolutely boiling hot heat um my my classmates were Nigerian, Zimbabwean, Zambian, American, British. There was such a mixture of people and it was just incredible. And I made wonderful friendships and got to work with some of the specialists in HIV AIDS, which was the topic that I was looking at. And I was just really lucky to be there. Um, And I did my dissertation research on the impact of HIV AIDS on, on young people in South Africa because it was such a huge problem. And um, I did some of my uh, data collection at a baby's home. And when I was looking through their annual report, I saw in the back that it said, thank you very much to Coco, Newcastle upon Tyne for their support. And I thought, Newcastle upon Tyne, that's where I'm from. And started doing a little bit of research and, and got in touch with Coco and asked them if I could have a job. They said, we don't have any jobs going. So I said, can I volunteer? And then as soon as I finished in Durban, I started volunteering at COCO. Um, That was in 2004. I went for it and then they invited me for a job interview on my 24th birthday (laughs) and gave me a job as their projects coordinator. And I've just worked my way up since then. Wow two fours there's lots of twos and fours there in (laughs) in your time I think that's your lucky number 24 Mm, maybe maybe Maybe. (laughs) um but wow what a story it is um very interesting actually and as you said almost serendipitous to have landed and uh navigated the career that you have that's incredible yeah. and I think a lot of it is that there is that sense of serendipity which I can put I do really believe in but I also think that you've got to be brave enough to take the opportunity so it was you know it was quite brave of me to ask them for a job it was quite brave of me to say okay I'll work for free it was quite brave of me to ask my mum and dad if I could live with them because I couldn't afford to go and live anywhere else and couldn't for the first few years when I was at Coco but I as some people say to me are you not worried that you've been there for too long but I started as a volunteer and I became projects coordinator gradually became operations manager and all along the way I've learned how to do new things and met some of the most incredible people and I just think if I have this kind of feeling that if it isn't broken don't fix it And I have so many friends who work in the city and they're miserable, but they love their pay packet and they they work really hard Monday to Friday and then they party hard at the weekends. But I get so much more out of Coco than just a nine to five. My it's it's kind of it's 
it, it's all I've known my career, my whole career. But I've also brought into that new skills and expertise from my MBA, from the people that I network with, from our corporate supporters, from experiences like climbing Kilimanjaro and cycling across Maasai land. Honestly, where else could you do that? I, and I just think I've got the best job in the world. So if I stopped doing it, then more fool me. <laughs> It's a really good point. I think uh, when when you um, when when you're really passionate about something, you know, it's nice to hold on to that. And actually, I'm sure you did this when you did your MBA. But we looked at our career drivers and what motivates us. It was really interesting for me. Um, money was the lowest of it; wasn't even a factor for me. Um, but actually, it was more the affinity or the. Um, the ability to advocate or give back or things like this and I think those are all important things in, in what you're doing um, and I, w- I wonder um, as you've been talking there about all the people that you've met and how it's helped you in your career journey grow what else has helped you how have you found you know yourself and your confidence as a leader and, and this type of thing um I've only recently discovered the enormous benefits of having a coach and it came about after a couple of blips with kind of feeling really like I like I wasn't confident and I wasn't on top of my game and maybe it was time to do something else but I didn't really want to it was just because the business well the charity was sort of just stale and and we weren't growing as much as I wanted to and I was concerned that that was maybe me and sometimes it's hard to do you you want someone to tell you the cold hard truth but I I needed somebody outside of the organization to kind of help me through that so um one of my board members who's just stepped down actually who's incredible and she's been a brilliant mentor for me um she introduced me to a friend of hers who was doing her coaching degree at university and needed a guinea pig for want of a better description and Nina met with me a year ago and we just had our final coaching session um last week on Friday and that has been an absolutely incredible experience and we talked about how um at at the beginning my main um goal was to become less emotional in professional situations because sometimes I'd go into the boardroom and I'd be talking to the board and I'd just feel like you're not hearing me but actually I needed to communicate differently um so Nina really taught me how to how to kind of self-evaluate and self-coach myself so she's left me with this really great skill that I'm still learning to use where um I, I do take time to kind of think about um, and prepare myself for these situations and I think sometimes you need somebody external to help you through those things particularly if you're in a relationship or um, or living at home with your with your parents because it's family and husbands that get it <laughs> all the time and if you want to if you want to maintain a healthy personal life you've got to sometimes know when to leave work at work um and Nina was a great place to kind of <laughs> offset all of that and help me work through it so i think coaching and mentorship is hugely hugely important um and she she teaches me something new every day and I can highly recommend it. She's she's qualified now. She's a professional coach. And I'm sure if I have a another blip in the future, she'd be the first person that I'd call upon. It's interesting how transformative that experience has been for you and how you you've held on to that as a really, um, really important turning point for yourself. That's great. Yeah, we were just talking the other day about we I looked back at our first meeting and the notes from that meeting and all I wanted to do was I I kept coming up with this um, idea of turning up to a board meeting and I use the board meeting as an example because it's probably as a chief exec, it's the time when you are most under, you know, um, pressure to deliver and you want to you want to deliver great news to your board and you want to come across as cool, calm, collected and confident. And I kept telling her that I had this image in my head and and we worked on kind of visualising 
And I, I always sort of saw myself as wanting to be like, I don't know if you ever watched The Good Wife and um, Alicia Florrick is fantastic in The Good Wife. She's going through loads of things at home. She's really stressed out. She's that She's got kids and bills to pay and stuff going on. But when she walks into the courtroom, she is in a fabulous suit. Her makeup's perfect, her hair's done and she's on it. And that's kind of where I wanted to get to. But visualising it kind of helped me look for what my goal would be and that had other knock-on effects as well of like well how am I going to get there what what is it that I actually want and it's actually impacted on my well-being in a really positive way because it made me realize actually I want to start running again and I, I want to lose a bit of weight and I want to spend more time with my husband and I want to spend more time with my nieces and I want to start swimming again so all of those things kind of you can only do those things if you give yourself the time and the space for self-reflection and that was something I hadn't been doing I'd just been going a hundred miles an hour and actually not being that effective (laughs) it's interesting you say that yeah I think we all um we all do that don't we we there's always so much to do and especially working in a charity there is always something to do. You, you could be there 24 hours a day every day and there would still be stuff to do. So actually um, that old um, kind of story of you've got to look after yourself first, put your, your mask on first. Self-care is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I remember one of my board members saying to me that I needed to work on um, my work on wearing the mask. And I I really took that the wrong way <laughs> and and I didn't know why it offended me so much but I just thought why do I have to wear a mask why do I have to be somebody else in in a boardroom and somebody else somewhere else I just wanted to be me and when I worked through that with my coach we established that it was absolutely imperative for me whatever I was doing to be authentic And if there was ever a situation where I couldn't be authentic, I really struggled with that. So I might be in a boardroom and I have to present some information and maybe someone would say something that would be like, oh, well, you know, that information wasn't very clear. (laughs) And it's not a massive criticism, but I'm not very good at taking criticism and I've had to learn that as well. Um, And instead of sort of stopping and thinking, oh, okay, well, how could I make it clearer, which is what I would do now. In the past, I'd be like, well, I think it's absolutely fine. And I don't know what you're talking about. And that's ridiculous. And, And kind of, and you get yourself all wound up about these things that actually you're all there for the same reason. You're all there for the same purpose. These people are giving up their time to help um, lead you, govern you and give you loads of support. I've got an incredible board. I wouldn't have got so stressed out by them if they weren't incredible because they ask all the right questions. They keep me on my toes. They they push me to do better, but they also look out for me. Um, so after every board meeting... Um, I know Lisa mentioned Carsten in her podcast and I didn't want to give him another name check because he'll just get a big head. But he um, he's the one that got me my sponsorship at the at the business school. So I owe him a great deal. But after every board meeting without fail, he'll call me and check that I'm OK. And I think that's really important. That goes beyond the role of a board member to kind of just pick up the phone and go, you OK? Is everything all right? How did you think that went? Um, and I, I think that's... I think I'm very lucky. I have, they need to be um, kind of slightly out of reach board members. They need to be kind of people that you look up to and you respect and you want to show up and impress. But also it helps that some of them are quite happy to take you out for a glass of wine when you really need it. (laughs) Yes, very, very important, very special. And also just having people who believe in you and see things in you and have the honesty to tell you. I mean, that, that, that can be um, really powerful in itself. Um, I think a lot of people, um, we shy away from conflict, so we don't always have those conversations and it can be really hard to know how to navigate something when you can feel there's a vibe but you don't know what the problem is. So actually having that honesty and having people who who tell you, you know, um, but at the same time I can... uh, sympathize with you in, in taking that criticism and what do you do with it you know it's it's have you ever read um my favorite harvard business uh review uh 
It's crazy that I have Harvard <laughs> Business Review, Faith, but I do. Um, but it's called Monkey Management. Have you ever read that article? Uh, I haven't read that article, but I've got a book that I think is based on the same thing. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> it's the concept of, you know, someone, whether it's in your personal life or a boss or whoever, someone can go, come up to you and basically pass you monkeys. So it could be that they bump into you in the corridor or someone on the bus and they've got whatever's going on in their life and somehow it ends up in your shoulders and it's so stressful but actually you've got you have to learn to kind of take their monkeys and give them back to them or put them somewhere else and I've been uh, learning about this a lot but I think sometimes um I'm just thinking out loud about what you were talking about there about uh, uh taking criticism and things like this um actually it it can sometimes also be a projection of other people's stuff and you have to kind of go is this my monkey yeah okay it is okay I'm just gonna sit with this feeling and it's it's quite uncomfortable you know that kind of thing yeah and I think sometimes when I when I look back um at 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 some of the examples that I gave Nina my coach um she would she would always say to me well when he or she said that um were they being aggressive or were they tell me tell me what how they were saying it and actually when I gave it some thought they weren't at all it's just what they were saying wasn't what I wanted to hear so um I would then go back and go oh well I think he was really rude and that was just really mean to say that and actually it it was my perception of what was being said. So as much as it can come from the other person, it having a coach really taught me about being aware of my own filters and my own expectations. And, you know, I have this crazy notion in my head that I'm going to go into a boardroom and I'm going to walk in and everyone's going to be like, wow, that was amazing, Lucy. You absolutely nailed all of it. But that's never going to happen. There's the the the, the board and, and your superiors in, in whatever walk of life are there to, you know, make you the best you can be. So if they can't, so I, I kind of want to be criticised, but I don't. But I know that if I if I do get criticised, then it's just going to make me better. And actually, it's something I'm constantly working on as a manager within my own organisation. I've got an incredible team. But if ever I need to speak to them about something other than like perfection and joy and excellence, I find it really difficult as well because we're a small team and, you you know, they're, they're made of strong stuff, most of them. So I'm quite lucky. Um, but also kind of empowering them to know that they can tell me as well when maybe I'm not doing the right thing. There's a reason that I have a team that are all better at things than me. Um, And it's kind of recognising what skill sets you've got and making sure that you surround yourself with people that can do other things. And But make sure that you've still got something to add and, and finding out what that is because I think that's really helpful for your confidence. If people say... Ask Lucy, she's got really good ideas when it comes to creativity or fundraising campaigns or something like that. And then you think, oh, have I? Great. Okay. (laughs) And then pretend that you knew that all along. (laughs) It always amazes me what other people see in you that you never see in yourself. You know, uh, sometimes it feels like a gift. Oh, that's news to me. Thank you. You know, um, it's actually um, a lot of fun to find these things out. And actually, yeah, also... um, seeing how other people um what they notice and how they view you can be really powerful too have you ever done lego serious play no so (laughs) we just did this last week in my mba oh my goodness it is the best thing i've ever done i can't stop talking about it to people so it's just sparked so much creativity and it's definitely worth your next team building exercise if you can do it for your team but it really helps you to um come up with things that are so out of the box but really explore as a team your strengths and your weaknesses in a way that other people see but you don't and also um your, yourself as well um I found it really powerful oh that's great that sounds like a good idea yeah I might need to go back to business school <laughs> <laughs> well I've got just the contact for you which we can chat about later <laughs> we've actually run out of time now so um I've got two questions I wanted to ask you super quick okay since you have spent so much time uh, working on your learning and development and bettering yourself I know you're fond of coaches but would you recommend any particular book or um or other resource that's helped you in your personal development 
Well, it's funny you should mention the monkey thing because I've just remembered the name of the book. I was hoping it would come back to me before the end. And it, it's a book called The One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. And one of my board members recommended that to me a little while ago, which was brilliant. And I'm going to be really cheeky and say another one, which I'll probably have to find the exact title of, but it's um, Cognitive Behaviour in Management. And it's got some really good... Um, uh, chapters on time management, leadership, and it's been really helpful. It's kind of been my my go to book throughout my coaching. There's loads out there, but I could I could always send you the link so when you post the podcast, we can let people know. <laughs> Sounds good. And the other question I have for you, which is always my favorite question, what is it for you? What is the number one word that helps you to nurture your zest? Oh, I have listened to another couple of your podcasts, so I'm going to be cheeky like Maggie on this one, and I'm going to ask you for a phrase, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, it's something that Nina said to me just the other day. I was worried about what I was going to say for this, and it is, I am enough. And I think sometimes we just need to stop and remind ourselves that we are enough. That's very important, very, very special. Um, that's actually my favourite quote. I forget who says it, but... Um, actually there's, there's quite a long quote but that those three words I am enough it's a really powerful affirmation um, so thank you so much for leaving us with that today and um, it's good for listeners to know as well that we are all enough and um, to believe in ourselves thank you so much Lucy thank you you've been listening to Nurture Your Zest you can find us online on Facebook Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Nurture Your Zest. If you've liked today, please subscribe. You can also leave us a review if you're feeling extra kind. Today's podcast has been made available through the kind sponsorship of TL Multimedia and That Branding Company. We look forward to catching up with you again soon as you learn to nurture your zest.